here's another example of conducting a hypothesis test for means with a large sample, large being greater than 30. Now, I, I am going to try to go through this video a little bit faster than one of my other ones. Um, and so if you want to watch the other one, um, it'll probably go a little bit longer and I might go a little bit more in depth. But with this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip through this one as fast as I can. Um, now, the one thing that I want to say before I go any further is this eventually... I will show you that this is a two-tailed test. Um, the other one that I did was a one-tailed test. In fact, it was a left-tailed test. So if you want to look for a one-tailed test, watch one of my other videos, and uh, that might help you out. But anyways, PHANTOMS is an acronym for taking you through a hypothesis test. So I'm going to go P stands for something, H for something, A for something, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm going to jump right in and start working through this example. It says, Mr. Mays watched a recent news report. And by the way, I'm Mr. Mays, just in case you were wondering. But Mr. Mays watched a recent news report that claimed that teenagers send an average of 100 texts a day. He doesn't believe that this is true. So he asked a random sample of 50 teenagers, my students, how many texts they send in a day. His sample gave a mean of 90 texts per day with a standard deviation of 25 texts per day. Is there enough evidence to support the news report at alpha equals 0.05? Now, I'm going to jump right into P, and P stands for parameter statement. And that's where I state my claim. I'm going to state at the very beginning what I am testing, and then at the very end, I'm going to make a decision about that claim. So I'm going to go ahead and type this one in instead of writing it. I will test the claim that the mean number of texts sent by teenagers is 100 texts per day. <clears throat> now there's a key little word in this claim that I want to point out because the key little word is going to lead me to the next thing which is H, the null and alternative hypotheses. H stands for hypotheses and the key word is is. So as I jump ahead here, H stands for hypotheses, and I'm going to write my null and alternative hypothesis right here. If you're not sure how to write the null and alternative, again, one of my other videos helps you out with how to set up a null and alternative hypotheses. But I am dealing with means, so I'm going to use mu right here. Um, because mu is a parameter, and I'm testing the parameter. And this, is, this little word says is. Well, that is in the claim, and the claim is, is an equal sign. Okay? So I'm going to say that mu is 100 texts per day. And my claim is right here. I always like to label where the claim is because eventually we are going to make a decision to either reject or not reject this null hypothesis. And if I reject this, then that tells me what I should do with the claim. Does my evidence support the claim or does it not support the claim? Well, it depends on whether I reject or I don't reject the null hypothesis. Well, if the null hypothesis says that mu is equal to 100, the alternative has to say that mu is not equal to 100. If this symbol was different, like greater than or less than or equal to, then this symbol would also be different. So the symbols here have to be complements of each other. And again, if you watch one of my video, my other video on just writing a null and alternative hypothesis, it might help you with this. But anyways, I'm going to keep going. So now I'm at A, which is assumptions and conditions. Assumptions and conditions. There are two assumptions or conditions that I need to check. One of those assumptions is the randomization condition. I can't spell randomization condition. And in this case, it tells me in the original problem that I randomly chose my students or my, or my sample. So the sample was randomly chosen. 
it tells me that in the in the uh, original problem so that means that this particular condition can be checked off this is good to go the other condition that I need to check is called the nearly nearly normal condition well usually if you have raw data you can actually make a histogram of your raw data and check to see if it's nearly normal well, in this case I don't have the raw data I have our, I have just been given the basic statistics so I'm going to assume that's why this step is called assumptions and conditions I'm going to I will assume that <clears throat> the data are nearly normal so there we go I have made I have checked off one condition and I have made an assumption that is very important all right the next step is in which stands for name the test name the test well in this case since I have an equal sign in my null hypothesis that tells me that this is a two-tailed test and since I am conducting a test for means with a large sample that tells me it is a Z test so as I name my test I will say this is a two-tailed Z test with alpha equal to 0.05 alpha is called your level of significance and it should always be stated somewhere and the best place to put alpha is here where it says name the test so I've named the test I'm conducting a two-tailed Z test with alpha equals 0.05 all right let me continue now um, the next step is called the test is T and that means I'm going to find the test statistic and there's a formula for finding the test statistic when you are looking for a test statistic for a large sample let me go ahead and copy this I've got it right here I'm gonna copy and paste it into my document So it's a little bit easier to see there we go okay so here's the formula for the test statistic and let's also keep in mind that this is a two-tailed test so once I find my test statistic it is going to I'm going to find the positive of it and the negative of it and find the area under the curve that's my ultimate goal is to find the area under the curve and compare that area under the curve to alpha but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself let me find this test statistic right now well my sample mean X bar my sample mean was right here 90 texts per day so I put 90 right there mu that's the value that I am testing well the claim said 100 so I put 100 in right there and I divide that by my standard deviation and my standard deviation was 25 over the square root of my sample size and my sample size was 50 now I'm gonna go ahead and do all the math off to the side I've actually done the math ahead of time and when I do all the math here my test statistic ends up being negative 2.83 okay now since this is a two-tailed test I need to label 2.83 on both sides negative 2.83 here and actually positive 2.83 here because since this is a two-tailed test I need to find the area in both of these tails right here and right here okay my null hypothesis had an equal sign in it and since my null hypothesis had an equal sign that tells me it's a two-tailed test and since it's a two-tailed test I need to use 
my test statistic to find the area right here, and then I'm going to double it so that I get the area in both tails. That's how I find what's called the p-value. Um, the next thing that comes up in phantoms is O. The letter O stands for obtain the p-value. And I'm going to check two things. Now, I've done this on a different document, so I'm going to do a little bit of copying and pasting here. <clears throat> but when I obtain my p-value, there are two things that I'm checking for. And those two things are these. If my p-value is less than alpha, and remember alpha in this case was 0.05, I'm comparing my p-value to alpha. If my p-value is less than alpha, less than right here, then I will reject the null hypothesis. If my p-value is more than alpha, then I would fail to reject my null hypothesis. Well, let's go ahead and find the p-value. Well, in order to find the p-value, I'm going to use my calculator. The p-value, this is just area under a normal curve. The p-value in this case is equal to 2 times normal CDF on my calculator from negative 99 to negative 2.83 because that's my cutoff point. Here's my z-score right here. z equals negative 2.83 and then this actually goes on forever and ever and ever so my, my, right hand, my left hand boundary is just negative 99. Um, if you need some more explanation on that, I do have another video, but that's, that's one that uh, if you've gotten to this point in a stats course, you probably understand this normal CDF. And the reason I'm multiplying by 2 is because this is a two-tailed test. If this was not a two-tailed test, I would not multiply this normal CDF by 2 to get my p-value. But since it's a two-tailed test, I have to find the area in both of those tails. All right, let's go to my calculator. I'm going to go second, VARS, and then go to number two, normal CDF. I'm going from negative 99, comma, which is right above the 7, to negative 2.83. And I'll hit enter. That gives me a that gives me 0 0.0023, but remember I want to take that and multiply it by 2. And when I multiply it by 2, I get 0 0.00465. So I bring this over here, and I want to just label a couple of things. Remember, now I know that my p-value is equal to 0 0.00465. Five. You don't want to round off too much because remember I'm comparing my p-value to alpha and in this case alpha is 0 0.05. Now is the p-value less than or is it more than alpha? Well in this case 0 0.00465 is less than 0 0.05. So since my p-value is less than alpha, I will reject the null hypothesis. And that leads me to m in phantoms. m stands for make a decision. And I just stated my, my decision. I'm going to go ahead and type it in. Since my p-value is less than my level of significance, level of significance is alpha, that's the name of alpha, level of significance. Since my p-value is less than my level of significance, I will reject the null hypothesis. So there I've made my decision, and the last step, S, just going to type this one in, S stands for state your conclusion. And I need to conclude, I need to make a conclusion about the, the claim. Well, if I am going to reject the null hypothesis, 
and the null hypothesis is the claim, that means I do not support the claim. My evidence does not support the claim. So let me type that in. At the very end, the very last thing I want to type here is this. I do not have enough evidence to support the claim that teens send 100 texts send an average, don't forget that, an average of 100 texts per day. I do not have enough evidence to support that claim because I rejected the null hypothesis. So I hope that this example helps you and um, I'm probably going to do another video that shows you how you can do some of this on your calculator as well. Um, continue watching my videos if you like them. Hopefully they're helpful. If you want to comment, that would be great too. And uh, good luck in your stats class.